NLP practitioners and master practitioners, they have kind of learned the trauma process on their original trainings. But that in itself is not quite enough for them to feel confident to go into those places. So when I ran this training uh, after the Christchurch earthquake, I, I trained uh, people in Christchurch there. And most of the people, we had, we had a uh, training room filled like this, so as many people as here. And most of those uh, people were actually working for government agencies, so they were civil defence people and uh, healthcare workers going into Christchurch. And mostly they were pretty damn scared. You say damn, didn't you? So they, uh, <laughs> so they, they were, uh, they were going into this situation, and they were wondering if there's a big aftershock while I'm there, how will I cope myself? So there were three situations that they wanted to learn how to deal with. The first is, what in the crisis situation itself, if I was caught in the middle of an earthquake and there were people injured around me, and people dying or dead around me, what do I do, what do I say? So I wanted to train people in how to deal with that as well. And I, I don't mean I wanted to train you how to get under the tables and all that kind of stuff, but the, the NLP part of how do you cope with that. And so I, I want to briefly today, I want to go over what do you do if you are actually in the middle of a disaster as it's happening? How, what do you say to people if you're okay and they are injured? And I, I'm not teaching you that because that's what's going to happen. I'm teaching you it so you, you can relax about that and put that out of your mind. And then I want to show you how do you deal with it in the situation after, for example, the earthquake, while there are still uh, dangerous aftershocks that are happening, while people still don't have basic necessities for life, um, what, do you, what do you do in that situation? Because the, the traditional NLP trauma cure is based on a very fundamental assumption that the disaster is over. And so, you know, if I'm, if I'm referring to that uh, um, uh, movie technique where you rewind the movie, then what we are assuming is that there is a before the events happened, and in that same movie, and after the events happened. And in Tohoku today, that's not true. The earthquake is not over and uh, the events of the Fukushima reactors are not over. And people who are living in that area, they face that. They are still in this dangerous experience. And their distress reactions are, um, are the, still the reactions of shock and disbelief that happen when someone is right in the middle of a disaster. So over the last few years, we have a lot of research about how the memory of a traumatic experience is stored in the brain. And I, I want to teach you a little about that process of storing memories like this in the brain. If you try and change the way that a person stores a memory while the memory is still being laid down, it doesn't work the same way. The way I explain it is, if I have a, a memory, a, a video on my computer, and I want to move it to another uh, backup hard disk, and perhaps I say, cut from here and paste onto this backup. And then, once I've started that, then I think, oh, I'll just edit that video. So I click on the video to see if I can uh, open it up in my editing program and edit it. Then it will produce an error message. It will say, you are unable to edit um, this file while it's being transferred. So from the psychology research over the last <coughs> few years, we know that happens with memories of a crisis event. That's what happens in a crisis event in the brain that we know from the research in the last few years. So actually, during this period of danger, while this memory is still being laid down, uh, it's like being transferred from short-term memory to long-term memory, and it can't be changed as simply as it can a year later. So I want to show you how to work with people in this danger period when they're still laying down the memory. And actually, at that time, of course, if you say to people now, let me just show you how to relax, they will say things like, but what if there's an aftershock and the house falls down on me and I, and I die horribly while I'm relaxing? And so I want to show you how to deal with that kind of situation. They don't want just help with something that happened in the past. They want to know, how do I think about the future? How do I live when I don't know if I'm going to die in the next day? And then there is the post-crisis situation when, of course, we can do that traditional NLP trauma process. 
So I learned this especially in Christchurch. I, I flew into Christchurch two days after the earthquake there. And I saw two kinds of responses to this happening. Firstly, there was something they called in New Zealand the student army. So the student army was these um, big, strong 18-year-old people, men and women. And they would come in a great big uh, truck and they would just arrive in, in a street and they would have uh, shovels and uh, uh, all sorts of tools to, to clean up rubbish. And they would just go through and knock on everyone's door and they would dig out all of the mud that had been coming up from under the earth and, and they would tidy up. Them. As, they were, as they were doing this, um, they would be smiling and laughing. I saw this happening. They were having a great time. And they worked from when the sun came up to when the sun went down. So I saw that happening. And then I saw people standing on street corners just shaking. Just absolutely in shock. And then I went into a supermarket, and at that time, of course, there was very little on the shelves in the supermarket. The supermarket was mostly ruined. And I saw two men fighting over a loaf of bread, actually punching and pushing each other to try and get the loaf of bread. So, uh, so that situation, I especially want to get you to think about how do you deal with uh, a situation where the, the immediate earthquake is over, but there are still a lot of horrible things happening. Does this sound like what you were hoping for? This At the end of this two days, I want you to feel confident going into any of those situations. Confident doesn't mean you can fix everything. It means knowing what you can do and knowing what you can't do. It means remembering also that love is more important than the techniques. When the student army would come into a street, uh, the main effect they had was not to tidy up the street physically. It was to give those people there the feeling that someone's, someone loved them in this situation.